Hi, everybody. So this is part one of the demonstration for the milling machine um, first project, the angle plate in Machining 210. Uh, and this is all about tramming in the head, which is a, a special machining term that means aligning the head to the table. Um, so when we're machining, typically what we want is for the cutter to be square to the table and to the part. Um, but actually, these Bridgeport-style knee mills have the capability to be oriented and aligned in a number of different positions, um, like the ram can be moved in and out, the head can be tilted left and right, it can be knotted forward and backward, um, the whole uh, column can be rotated around 360 degrees. So there are a number of different orientations and alignments here. Um, but what we usually want is for everything to be square. And so that versatility or flexibility is both the strength and the weakness of this machine. Uh, because you can set it in different positions and therefore you have to make sure that it's set in the correct position that you want before you get started. So that's what we're gonna do here. And we'll do both the head and we'll be doing the vise as well. So I'm probably gonna change the angle of the camera a few times during this demonstration. Um, but for now, I just kinda want you to see uh, what I'm going to be working on uh, so that when I reference things in a different camera angle, you know what it is that I'm talking about. So this lever right here is actually used to move the quill up and down, and I'm going to be using this for rough positioning. Um, by the way, this pops right out, so actually I'm going to take this out at some point just so that it doesn't get in my way. All right? This is the quill lock right here, and that's definitely going to come in handy so that the quill doesn't move around as I'm taking my measurements. Um, for the majority of this process, I'm going to have the spindle in neutral, and that is a position between high and low, and that's just so that the spindle rotates really freely right there. Um, in order to make the actual adjustments on the head, I've got two directions. I have what I call the tilt, which is if you're looking at the mill, that's left and right, and then if you're looking at the um, at the head, there's also the nod, sort of forward and backward um, pivoting. And um, there are two different places where we s secure or lock the head in place, and two different places where we actually make adjustments. So for the tilt, the adjustment is right here. So we can spin that little nut. It's actually attached to the end of a threaded shaft that has a worm gear on it. Actually, it's a worm gear. Um, and that will turn the head left and right. And these four bolts right here are what we would loosen and tighten in order to allow it to move and then to clamp it down. Uh, for the nod, the pivot point is back here, and the adjustment is right here, right? And then these three bolts are what are uh, loosened and tightened in order to allow it to move and to fasten it. Okay, um, now before we get started, there's a little bit of, a, you know, tools that we have to grab and a little bit of, a, I guess, a strategy that we have to discuss. Um, first off, we've got these little table protectors that are really, really useful, but uh, we're going to need access to the, to the table right now, so I'm going to go ahead and remove those. Um, and we're going to need some wrenches. We're going to need a 7 8 wrench and a 3 quarter inch wrench. We're also going to need a tramming plate, which is this. And the tramming plate uh, is, well, I'll explain it in a moment, but this is actually the surface that we directly indicate off of. Actually, I'll probably keep this one right here, because I, I, I can use just one of them. Um, and then we also need an indicator. This is a test indicator. Um, this is similar to the dial indicator that we use for the lathe project, um, but it measures a little bit differently. I'll actually show you that a little bit later. We're also going to need one of these indicals. This is a specially designed clamp 
that clamps to the end of the spindle right here and holds the test indicator. And that's actually what we're going to be using um, to indicate. Okay, so that's all that. Now, the, the little bit of strategy here is, do we leave the vise on or do we leave the vise off? Because we could, we could tram in one of two ways. We could tram directly off of the table surface, and that's actually a pretty good way of doing it. Um, but some would argue that, well, let's say that the surface of the vise the, that mounts to the table, the bottom of the vise, let's say it's not perfectly parallel to this surface on the top of the vise where we put our parallels and on which we put our part, right? So in an imperfect world, one way of dealing with this issue would be to tram directly off of these surfaces on the vise, right? Because that's where our part actually goes. So we want our head to be square to the part, not necessarily square to the table. And that's true to a certain degree, to a certain degree. And it depends entirely on what kind of operation you're doing. So if you are drilling, then it makes perfect sense that you would indicate off or trim the head off of the vice surface. And then that way, the drilled hole will be perpendicular to the surfaces of the part as they sit on the vice. That makes perfect sense. And you can do that. Right, you can put this tramming plate directly on the vise. But for milling flat surfaces, actually it's better to indicate off of the table. Because when we're feeding the table, we're not feeding it along the axis of the vise. We're actually feeding it along the axis of the table way surfaces. Which means that, um, if we have the head cocked out at a slight angle because we indicated it off of the vise, but it's at an angle relative to the, the way surfaces that the, that the table is riding on, um, then actually it's going to cause us to machine a surface that is not truly flat, or at least doesn't have the orientation that we want relative to our part. Now, that's something that I'll explain a little bit later. So here I'm actually going to go ahead and remove the vise. And so I'm going to use the 7 8 I'm going to use the 7 8 wrench in order to do that. Wow, that's really tight. OK. And then these, these nuts are mounted on studs. Nuts are mounted on studs that are... <sighs> wow, that was really tight. So these studs are mounted into T-nuts uh, that uh, ride along in these T-slots in the table. So you can position them wherever you need to put them. Uh, for now, I'm just going to back them off and then lift that vise off. We'll be coming back to that vise in a little bit when we put it back on and we indicate it. Uh, for now, we don't need it. And uh, what I do need to do, though, is... Wow, that's a dirty T-slot. Um, this whole area here is, uh, you can't really see it, but it's absolutely filthy. And, um, you know, I've got an acronym that I like to use, uh, which is COSMOS. C-O-S-M-O-S. -O -S. It stands for caution, only schmucks. Measure over schmutz. And it's so true. You must make sure that everything is absolutely clean if you're going to put any mating surfaces or inspection surfaces or fixturing surfaces uh, you know, over top of that material. I'm going to go ahead and hit that with the, the towel right there, get it nice and clean. OK, very good. OK. And now I can grab this tramming plate. And I need to make sure that these three little feet on the bottom of the plate are also nice and clean. 
And um, when I put this tramming plate down on the table, I need to make absolutely sure that those feet are sitting on top of the table and not sitting in one of those grooves. And that looks pretty good. Now, why do we even use those three little feet to begin with? Well, this, the top of the surface on the milling machine, on the table here, um, has been dinged up over time. And actually, even when it was first manufactured, if you look real closely at it, there are these sort of like crescent moon patterns in there. Um, and so this is not a regular surface. And of course, it's also interrupted by the T-slots themselves. And so what we'd like when we're indicating is a continuous surface to indicate off of. And so what we've done here is we've stepped off the uh, surface of the table, just projected it a little bit, and made it continuous. And we use uh, three little pins, three little points, because that's the minimum number that you need in order to establish a plane. And that way, any imperfections in the table aren't causing this plate to sit, um, you know, askew. So that's the reason why we use the tramming plates. But the, the surfaces on the bottom of the pins bottoms of the pins, and the top of this tramming plate surface should be very, very parallel to one another because they were surface ground and then checked on the surface plate. So unless they've been mishandled, then they should be really good. Okay, and then we've got the Indicol here. Indicol's got a bunch of different adjustments on it. So there's this adjustment here, this adjustment, this adjustment. Actually, that's for clamping the indicator as well. And then we have this that's for clamping the indicol onto the quill itself. I'm going to go ahead and put that right there and tighten it down. Now, try, try not to push this all the way up against the bottom of the quill on the bridge port because the quill doesn't spin but the spindle obviously does. And so if you bump this all the way up against the quill, then you run the risk of having the indicol, the top of the indicol, bind against the bottom of the quill at certain points in its rotation. You'll feel, feel like a little bit of a tugging, and we really don't want that. So just give yourself a little bit of space, just a little bit down on the spindle nose right there. And that seems to rotate really nice and free. If you put this into gear, it, there's gonna be a lot of resistance and you're gonna be fighting the pulley, basically, and that's not something you wanna do. Okay, so that's a good position right there. Gonna grab my indicator. I'm gonna go ahead and get this out of the way. Okay, the indicator has a, a little well, there are a couple of ways to mount the indicator. It has this little stem on the back. This is an attachment um, that attaches onto the dovetail supports on, uh, that are actually built into the body of the indicator. Uh, and so you could, some of these indicals are actually designed to have dovetail mounts built into them, little dovetail clamps, but most of the time they get broken off, I guess, by um, you know, overzealous students who just tighten too hard. Uh, so, you know, at the very least, you can have one of these little uh, rod attachments that then goes into this little hole, and you can tighten that. Okay, you gotta just position this like so. You really have to make sure that this little this little indicator on the end, or the, the uh, little pointer arm on the end of the indicator is screwed in to the pivot because uh, that's all that's holding it in there. And if it's not screwed in all the way, if it's not tight, then it's gonna wiggle a little bit inside of the clearance and the screw threads, and it's gonna give you bogus measurements. Oh, nice and tight, good. Okay, so the aim of the game here is to position the quill on the center of the tramming plate and to position this indicator so that it has the correct orientation relative to the top of the tra tramming plate and so that it's sweeping a diameter which is very close to the tramming plate diameter, right? Still has to be on the tramming plate, but we'd like it to be uh, as close to the maximum size as possible because the further the, di the bigger the distance over which we're measuring, the more the error is going to be uh, amplified. 
And so that's going to help increase the sensitivity of the measurement. OK, let's get the spindle centered. We can just use the table to get it more or less centered by I on the tramming plate. So left and right, and then forward and backwards. That looks pretty good. OK, then I'm going to go ahead and bring the quill down a little bit so that the indicator is a little bit closer. Um, now, I really need to make sure that the indicator uh, pointer arm has the correct angle relative to the tramming plate. Now, the, the angle of the indicator itself is kind of irrelevant um, because the pointer arm can be adjusted to whatever angle you need. Um, but you need to make sure that the pointer arm itself has a particular angle relative to the tramming plate. Now, because of the way that this works, it's actually measuring a rotative motion here, right? It's not measuring a linear displacement. It's measuring the rotation of this little arm. So really, this thing would like to be perfectly horizontal to the surface that you're measuring. But we can't usually get away with that, because if I put this exactly horizontal, then I would probably bottom out on the indicator body before I actually contacted the indicator tip or the pointer arm. So I need to adjust it at some angle, right? some minimal angle. But if I go too far, and let's say I have that drastic angle right there, well, now I'm going to create a much less sensitive measurement, because the actual movement up and down that I'm trying to measure is going to be a smaller component of the rotation of this pointer arm. I hope that makes sense. You get a sort of, um, if you use trigonometry to figure out what the error is, it's called a sine error. And um, if you're over 60 degrees, the sine error is really, really, really pronounced. But anything under, let's say, like 12 to 15 degrees, the error is not typically very big, or is, isn't very big, mathematically speaking. Um, also, we're not really looking for a specific absolute number for our measurement here. We're just trying to see, you know, we're just trying to get everything to read zero everywhere, right? So, you know, if the, you know, half of a thousandth of an inch or one thousandth of an inch on this dial exactly correlates to a half a thousandth or a thousandth of movement, doesn't really matter as long as it reads zero everywhere. We can get it close enough. All right, but we should maintain that 12 to 15 degree relationship. So that looks about right right there. If I bring this down, you can see that the pointer arm is touching, uh, but it's not bottoming it out on the indicator body anywhere. So that looks pretty good to me. Now, the other thing is that remember, I have to position this so that the swept diameter is big enough to give us a good amplification of the reading but it still has to be inside of the tramming plate uh, size. And that's just a little bit too big. I'm just going to push it in. Just physically move the indicator so it's closer to the center of rotation. Bring it down. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. That's good. Well, we're about like a quarter inch away from the end of the uh, tramming plate. I just adjust that indicator arm a little bit. OK. So now we're ready to actually go in and start taking readings and making adjustments on both the tilt and the nod, which we're going to adjust independently. And I usually just start with the nod, um, maybe just out of habit, but it's also kind of like the more difficult one to wrap your head around conceptually. So I try to get that one out of the way to begin with. And then we'll go to the tilt. Uh, and then we'll probably have to go back to the nod, because adjusting one direction typically throws out the other one. Actually, before we take a deep dive into indicator readings and uh, all those kinds of very fine adjustments, uh, let's just visit one quick concept here. What if the head is really, really, really out of alignment? Uh, this indicator only has a range of about 30 thousandths of an inch that it can read. And so if the head is knocked out considerably, then this thing is going to be almost useless. So let, let me just go ahead and remove this, and let's discuss, 
let's discuss the worst case scenario. Actually, let me go ahead and knock this out so that we can make it just a little bit more challenging. I like a good challenge. So that's three. Wow, it's tightened by a gorilla. Okay, so that's the adjustment screw for that direction. Let's go ahead and snug that back up. Okay, and then let me crack these loose. There are only three for the nod and there are four for the tilt. Ooh. I'm going to knock this out. There's a lot of backlash in this screw, folks. A lot of backlash. Okay. So that is knocked out considerably. That's way outside of the measuring range uh, of the indicator. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can get this pretty close. I mean, uh, the, the nod and the tilt both have these little angle, um, angle scales on them. Uh, it's just a piece of stamped uh, metal, or I think aluminum, uh, that's been riveted to the cast iron components. Uh, so it's really not a very precision kind of uh, scale, but I mean, it'll get you within a degree for sure, probably a half a degree. Um, we'd like to get maybe just a little bit closer so what we do is use one of these called a machinist's square, where it has, it's a two body construction. It has a blade. It's really like a straight edge. It has very, very straight flat sides, uh, which are parallel. And then it's, um, I think either, I think it's glued, glued or welded or something, but um, permanently joined to this uh, base right here, which is also super straight and flat and parallel. Um, and they orient this surface on the blade very, very perpendicular to the base, right? So we can use this as like a known 90 degree reference within, you know, probably within a, a couple of tenths of a thousandth of an inch. You know, it's, it's quite accurate. So if I run this down, run the quill down, give myself some room there. And then I put that square up on the tramming plate and I bump it up against the front of the quill. It's pretty clear that there is a bigger gap down here at the bottom than there is at the top because the quill is nowhere near parallel with that blade surface. Right? So in order to get it perpendicular, we just have to move it until it lines up with the blade. And it, looks like there's an even uniform gap between the quill surface and the square. Just gonna go ahead and pull back on this. Just gonna pull back on it until it looks pretty close. Now, I might even just leave it a little bit. If I have to bias it in any direction, I'm going to bias it so that the head is tipped forward a little bit rather than tilted back. Uh, and that's really just because with the head, we're always going to be fighting gravity because the pivot point is all the way back here and the weight of the head is all the way over here. And so it's going to want to sag because of the weight. And so uh, when we pull up on it and we're moving it from lower positions to higher positions, then it'll be evenly loaded or uniformly loaded on one side of the little gear that's in the back there. But if it's starting from a higher position and it's going to a lower position, then it's going to do this kind of shuddering motion as you let it down. Maybe I'll demonstrate that. Let me raise it up considerably. Okay, now let me let it down. I don't know if you can hear that. 
Yeah. So that's really annoying. And it makes for very difficult adjustments. So I would rather pull up on it than push down on it when I'm making fine adjustments. Let me get that back to where I was before. All right. So let's call that side good. Just snug those down so they don't move too much. Okay, now let me adjust the other side. Okay, that one's nowhere near. And so the head is tipped out this way and I need to bring it back in this direction. I can never remember which direction that is on the screw. I think it's this direction. So if I pull towards me, yes. If I pull towards me, it's gonna move the head that way. It'll move the top of the head to the left. And that's the direction I need. Now in this case, uh, it doesn't really matter, you know, which side I'm biased towards. But you gotta know one thing about this also, that you're also gonna be fighting the weight of the head, but in a completely different way, right? Now, the issue is that the pivot point is actually right smack dab in the center of the adjustment, right? But all of the weight is up here, right? So once you pass that sort of top dead center position, we get exactly to perpendicular, um, the weight of the head is kind of like on a little balance point, and it wants to flop over to one or the other side. So if you, you'll be going against the weight until you get to that point, and then it'll just flop over. And that can also be really, really, really difficult to adjust for. So the way that we'll sort of compensate for that is that we'll actually snug these down a little bit when we're making our fine adjustments, just so that it's got a little bit of friction on it and it doesn't flop over quite so easily. So now I'm close, according to the master square, and I'm ready to move on to the indicator. All right, pull the quill back up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and bring this down, and actually I'm going to do it over on this side, uh, because I'm going to start over here as a reference point for my measurements on the nod. I'm going to bring that down. And remember how I said that this indicator has about like a 30 thousandths uh, total travel range. So I'm going to be kind of in the middle of that. I like to position the needle towards the top of the dial. And I'll zero out the indicator by moving that, uh, by moving the bezel around. So now the zero is lined up with where the, um, uh, the needle is. Okay, so I'm zero over on this side, and I'm gonna rotate the indicator over to the other side. And I can see that there was a significant amount of movement from zero, and it was in the counterclockwise direction. So counterclockwise uh, is a negative direction, meaning that the plunger here, or not the plunger, but the pointer arm, uh, was less depressed on this side than it was on this side. And you can easily test which direction is plus and minus by sort of pulling up and down on the pointer arm like that. You know, when I push up on it with the ruler, it registers a value further to the right, I mean clockwise, okay? So if the needle is falling counterclockwise, that means that essentially the surface of the tramming plate on this side is further away from the indicator than it is over here on this side. Okay, so what does that actually mean in terms of the position of the head? That means that let's say uh, this is the two points that we're sweeping, so this point and this point are here and here, right? If it's further away from the tramming plate over here than it is over here, then that means that the head, if it's perpendicular to that reading, the head is tipped back like this. 
Okay, so actually we need to go further down uh, with the head in order to get these two to, to get closer to one another. Now here's the issue though with this particular reading, that actually the pivot point is all the way back here, but the measurement is taking place out here, right? So actually as we change the uh, position of the head, it's going to be moving both of the readings in the same direction, but the reading that's closer to the pivot point is going to be changing slower than the uh, reading that is further away from the pivot point, if that makes sense. So actually, um, what you need to do is move both of them in the same direction to get them to even out. Now, I have a kind of simple procedure that I use in order to get this right every single time. Okay? So let me go ahead and loosen the bolts on the, uh, the knot adjustment and I'll show you. Okay, here's the simple trick. I use the position that's closer to the pivot point as the reference zero. So I always adjust this position to read zero on the indicator. And then the position that's further away from the pivot point is where I make all of my adjustments or what I base all of my adjustments on. Okay? So I already know that I'm zero back here and I'm way out of whack over here. And I know that I need to bring this down. So I'm actually gonna push away from me on the adjustment screw. Okay, and I'm just going to adjust it until it gets to the zero. And if you overshoot, you can always pull it back a little bit. So actually, this is not the direction that I wanted to adjust this at all, but we'll be all right. Okay, now I'm going to go back over here to the beginning, or the first position, and you can see that uh, I'm not at zero anymore, which is fine. Okay, I'm going to use the knee the crank on the knee to re-zero that. I'll just bring it down and then bring it back up, like so. Okay? And then I'm going to go to this position again. And you can see that we still moved counterclockwise to a certain degree, but it was a much smaller value. Now we're only 10 thousandths of an inch out. Okay, no problem. So all I'm going to do is readjust this again to the zero. Nothing fancy, no real thought involved, just moving it always to the zero. Now I got cocked out again in this direction. Readjust it with the knee. Check what it is over here. Only 5,000 sound, great. Adjust it to the zero. Pull back on it like that. Okay, and go back to the start position. All right, I'm still not, you know, I moved away from zero, but not by very much. Re-zero it. So this method is so simple because all I'm doing is moving it closer and closer to the zero. Now I'm only one and a half thousandths out. Each one of these graduations is a half of a thousandths of an inch. So now I'm one and a half out. And I want to get it to between two graduations, meaning within a half a thousandths, um, over this distance, and that's about six inches. A half a thousandths over six inches is pretty good. Okay, so I'm just going to adjust it again. All I'm doing is zeroing the indicator closest to the pivot, and then moving the head, adjusting the head so that it's at zero in the position further away from the pivot point. And each time I do this, it gets progressively closer and closer and closer. You just do enough repetitions of this and it's gonna get you there. And there's no real thought involved. Because it can be kind of tricky if you overthink it start overshooting and chasing your tail. So now I'm within a half a thou. So that's pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and lock down those three nuts. Okay. 
Okay. Now, something you may have noticed, okay, is that I always travel in the same direction. I don't get to this point and then change direction to get back over here. Okay, I'm always rotating in the same direction. And that's because there is a slight difference in how this test indicator gets loaded. Right? If I come at a measurement from this side, or if I come at a measurement from this side, it loads the mechanism slightly differently and can actually give you a slightly different uh, value for your measurement. All right, so I just consistency is key here. The other thing that maybe you've noticed is that as I get to the left and right points, it starts moving around a lot, right? So I can get these two points to read true to one another, but from left to right, the tilt is definitely still pretty far off, okay? So now it's time to move over to the tilt, and since the tilt measurement was kind of throwing out the nod measurement, again, we're going to have to go back to the nod and at least double check it and probably readjust it. So I'm going to loosen those four bolts that are holding the, the tilt on or in place, and then I'm going to just snug them back a little bit, just, you know, basically like finger tight or just slightly more than finger tight. That just means that I've got a little friction there and it, you know, the head's not going to flop over quite as easily. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and zero this out on this side. Actually, I'm, I'm going to use the knee to do this. It's better to use the knee. Right there. Okay, so we're zero here. What are we out here? So there it went uh, 10, 11, 12, 12 and a half thousandths counterclockwise, so in the negative direction. It's kind of hard to see that, I know. Trust me, it went 12 and a half in the negative direction. So if it went in the negative direction, okay, that means that the plunger, or not the plunger, the pointer arm is less depressed here than it is here, meaning that the surface is further away from the indicator over here than it is over here. So it's sitting like that, right? So if the spindle is perpendicular to that, that means that the head is cocked out at this angle. I mean, the, the top of the head is cocked out too far to the right, and it needs to be brought more to the left. Okay, so let's adjust that. I'm going to go ahead and turn that worm gear shaft. When making the adjustment for the tilt, I have to remember that unlike the nod, where the measurement was out here and the pivot point was back here, meaning that I had to move both of the measurements in the same direction in order to make the adjustment, now the pivot point is actually right smack dab in the middle of the uh, adjustment range. Right? So whatever I do to one side, like a seesaw, whatever I do to one side, the exact same thing is going to happen to the other side, but in the opposite direction. So now what I have to do is I've got this 12 and a half thousandths over here and zero over here. If I move this side closer to the tramming plate by six thousandths, it's going to move this side further away by six thousandths, and that'll get me almost to zero. Does that make sense? I hope so. Let's try this out. So I'm going to adjust the shaft, the worm, worm screw shaft. Oh, went the wrong way. I always forget which way this thing is supposed to go. Maybe I'm just moving this back about six thou, okay, right there. And now let's go back to the first side. Oh, and it behaved a little strangely. Okay, let's re-zero that and take another measurement. So it really moved out of, out of position. Okay, so now we're actually, <laughs> we're 12 thousandths but the opposite way. So what happened, okay? What's, what can happen with this head is that the register 
that the head is sitting in, it's like two diameters, an internal diameter and an external diameter, that fit closely to one another, and that's what forms the actual pivot. Well, if there's any slop or clearance between them, when you change directions, it's not a purely rotative uh, movement. It can actually shift slightly inside of the clearance, uh, and that's actually what happened here. And it can happen, and it does happen. And so whenever you change directions in terms of your adjustment with the little um, screw shaft, uh, the adjusting screw, uh, then you really have to watch out and sort of, as soon as you feel it moving in the other direction, you get out of the backlash, you should recheck your zero. And that's something I didn't do. So I'm 12 thousandths of an inch out over here in the positive direction. Uh, and so the head is tipped too far this way. So the top of the head is tilted too far to the left, and I need to bring it back. All right, let's try that out. So as I make this adjustment, I am going to, as soon as I start registering movement over here, I'm going to, there we go, I'm going to go back to my zero over here and just readjust it, right? Just that now all of my measurements are being done in the same direction, so I'm gonna set a zero going this direction, give me a little bit better consistency. All right, recheck. Okay, so I'm eight thousandths out, which means I should, in theory, only need to adjust four thousandths. So I'm gonna go. And actually, I'm just gonna go ahead and adjust it three thousandths and then recheck my zero. There we go. This can sometimes be better just to make more measurements so that you're not chasing your tail everywhere. Okay. Yep, so I'm still about three and a half thousandths out, so I'll keep moving in the same direction. Okay, that moved it about uh, one and a half thousandths. Zero. Okay, I'm only, okay, still two thousandths out. So just a little bit further. Okay, zero on this side, and about a quarter of a thousandths out on this side. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and snug these bolts back up on the front, and I'm going to use a star pattern, meaning that I'm going to go, not just go around the circle with these four bolts, but I'm going to go across the pivot just so I bring everything up nice and evenly. And I'm actually not going to tighten this down all the way because, you know, when you clamp things down, they have a tendency to move out on you. I'm going to come out here and just double check that I am where I want to be. And I'm still within tolerance there. So now I will tighten this 100%. Okay. Okay, good. So we're, we're still in on the tilt, but now let's double check the nod. Let's double check the nod. Because my guess is that our measurement has been thrown out a little bit, or maybe it was just too difficult to get a good measurement before because we're so far out on the tilt. So I'm zeroed back here, and what do we have? So we are just over one thousandths of an inch off in the counterclockwise direction, which means that the head is tilted back a little bit. And we need to bring it back down. All right, but to adjust this, it's quite easy. We just loosen this all back up and move it back towards the zero. Just keep doing that little pattern back and forth. I mean, it makes it really easy to make the adjustment if you just know that little trick or follow that specific procedure. Let me loosen this. Use three bolts back here for the knot adjustment. 
you can see that it actually moved a little bit. Oh, over traveled. Move it back to the zero. Right about there. Let's see what it says in the back. Okay, it moved out. Can you zero that? Okay, that's pretty close. It's within two graduations, so it's within a half of a thousandth over that six inch d distance. So let me go ahead and snug up these three bolts, and then we'll double check to make sure we're within tolerance, because again, things tend to move when they're clamped. Nice. Let me go ahead and tighten it fully. Okay, and a final check, zero. And you can see that I'm actually uh, moving the indicator. I'm only handling it back here on this knob uh, because here I'm not going to be influencing the position of the indicator too much. Like if I push it, you can see it jumps around a little bit. Maybe you can see it better here. If I, if I push it here or here, it makes the indicator jump around a little bit. And so back here, it's not quite as sensitive. So that's a good place to, to hold it. Zero back here. Good. About a quarter thou here. Let's check the left to right. Let me zero it. If the tramming plate is really flat, then the, it should be zero everywhere. Whether it's left or right or forward or backward, it doesn't matter. But anyway, here's zero. And that looks like about a quarter thou. Now, I'm not sure how much you're seeing this in the video, but the angle at which you view the indicator has an effect on the actual reading that you get. And that's called parallax error, where there's actually a physical gap between where the, uh, where the lines and the numbers are on the dial face and where the uh, needle is on the indicator. And that physical gap, um, means that if you view this thing at an angle, it's going to look like the needle's lining up with a different line than if you're looking at it head on. So you're supposed to look at these head on instead of at an angle. Um, if they were at exactly the same level, then actually it wouldn't matter how you viewed them. But there is a little bit of a gap there just so that the needle doesn't touch the dial face. So you have to be a little bit careful when you, when you view these. But that looks pretty good to me. OK, great. So now it's time to move on to the vise. Let me just get all this stuff out of the way. Bring that quill back up. Remove this. Should really put it back into its holder. These are extremely sensitive instruments, so you have to take good care of them. Likewise for the tramming plate, which we don't need anymore. OK, so I've got the vise here on a cart. I've got this surface nice and clean. I'm cleaning off the, uh, the bottom of the vise so that it's not covered in any, in any schmutz. Okay. And then lift it up, put it on the side of the table like that, and then rock it in. And that just helps to kind of, you know, if there's anything it loosely adhering to the bottom of the vise, um, then putting it on at an angle and sliding it on like that will sometimes help to just knock it loose so that it doesn't go in between the surfaces. Because if you're sitting on a chip or anything, you know, I mean, we're talking about tolerances of a thousandth of an inch here. And so if you know, you've got a chip in there, the chip is probably going to be significantly more than a thousandth of an inch uh, in size. And so your vice is going to be sitting off by that amount. And it's going to throw your tolerances off. So every little bit counts. And I get this pretty close just by kind of feeling where these little um, slots are for the T-nuts. Um, and lining them up with this little slot in the table, in the T-slot in the table. And that gets you typically pretty close. Okay, put this in there. 
and get it finger tight. And then on the other side, oh, this one's wrestling with me a little bit. Okay, tighten this one down. Okay, just, just finger tight. And actually, um, I, I never leave this fully floating around, okay? It's very difficult to make adjustments um, if this is making sort of unpredictable movements because the vise is just floating around. It's a lot easier if you make a pivot point. So I'm just gonna tighten this bolt down a little bit. Enough so that you can still rotate the vise, but you know, um, you know, still having it secured for the most part. Uh, and actually, I forgot, we are not quite done with the indicator yet. So let me set that back up. Okay, here we go. Indicol on the spindle. Indicator in the Indicol. Okay. I'm gonna have to bring the knee down a bit. Let's give myself a little room. Okay, position that arm. Um, and so you can see that when we're in neutral, this rotates around quite a lot, quite easily. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and put this into, oh, yikes. Gotta tighten that down. Make sure the indicol is tight. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put this into low gear because when it's in low gear, it doesn't really wanna move very much, okay? I'm also gonna move this down a little bit and clamp it in place. And uh, all, all I'm really looking for is that I'll have access to this entire top portion of the fixed vise on, or fixed jaw on the vise. Um, we don't indicate the movable jaws on the vise because it's not a very good reference point because actually it shifts around a little bit. It's got a little bit of clearance. Actually, it's designed so that when you clamp, if you're clamping between two surfaces that are not perfectly parallel, this will slightly uh, rotate in order to conform to the, uh, the orientation of the two surfaces. So if we indicate this in, it doesn't really do anything for guaranteeing the position of our vise relative to the table. But this fixed jaw, I mean, it's fixed, so it doesn't move. Uh, and so what we wanna do is get that square to the table, right? So square to the movement of the table. So every time we put a part in there, it's gonna be oriented correctly square to the rest of the machine. Okay. So I'm gonna move the vise this way, the table this way, so that I'm touching the indicator. And again, I'm just gonna preload it so, sort of in the halfway point of its travel. And I'm actually gonna start over here on this side. Remember that I put a pivot over here, but there's no pivot over here. But both of my measurements are on this side of the pivot, okay? So just like when I was adjusting the nod on the head, both of these measurements are gonna move in the same direction, but this one's gonna move less than this one is. Okay, so just something to know. Let me re-zero this again, using the, uh, the handle on the, uh, the cross feed here, the y-axis direction. Okay, so that's zeroed out. I'm gonna feed all the way to the other side using the power feed, and you can rapid feed this if you want to, and you can see the way that it's moving. And when I get to this side, I have moved about, well, that looks like six and a half thousandths in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, I changed the angle so that you could see this a little bit better. Um, so you can see that I was at zero and I moved counterclockwise to about six and a half thousandths of an inch. So if I moved in the negative direction, right, that means that the vice jaw surface is further away from the pointer arm because the pointer arm is less depressed on this side than it was on this side, right? So again, I could use the ruler to just kind of tell which direction is which. So if I push the pointer arm out, it moves clockwise. Okay, so what that means is that I need the vise to go this way, 
right? So that this side comes out. It pivots around this way to bring this side of the jaws out more. And I'm going to do that just with a hammer. It's amazing how often the correct answer to problems in the machine shop really is just to hit it with a hammer. And I'm going to hit it on the right side of the vise, right here. And I'm actually just, again, just like with the nod, I'm going to hit it up to zero. I'm not going to try and split the difference or anything. I'm just going to hit it to zero, go back to my original reference point, re-zero the indicator, and then come back out here and make my adjustments. Same exact principle. And you can already see that it's running out considerably less. It may even be good enough. Let me go ahead and re-zero right there. Okay, and let's run back to the other side. Makes it really easy to use the power feed. You can see it's not moving very much at all. Okay, so I'm still out in the same direction, but only one thousandths now. So again, I'm just going to move it to the zero. Every time I do this, I get closer and closer and closer. Okay. Not much adjustment to make here. There we go. Zero. Back to the far right. And you can see you don't want the indicator so you don't want the indicator position so low that it would uh, hit one of these counter bores. Okay, I mean, it still says zero. So let me go ahead and snug this side down. Okay, now both sides are snug. I'm going to do a final test to make sure that the vice didn't move out too much while I was tightening that bolt down. Zero. Okay, back to the other side. And that is within a half of a thousandths. It's not perfect, but it's within a half a thousandths over six inches. Tighten everything down all the way. And again, a final check. I always do a final check. Now it doesn't matter which way I run this thing. So I'm just going to zero it out over here. And it should read within a half thou everywhere. So it dips a little bit in the middle. But then it comes back over to this side. And it comes back to, oh, about a quarter of a thousandths out. Now, why did it dip in the center here? Right? Well, it dipped in the center because the vise is worn right here in the center. Because when we clamp parts, it's almost always here in the center, not on the sides. So if it's going to wear anywhere, it's going to wear in the middle. Uh, not very fast because this is hardened steel, but yeah, it's going to wear a little bit. So we should expect it to dip a little bit right here in the center, but not too much. So this is perfectly acceptable. OK, now I really can remove these tools. So this is good to go. And we could actually start taking cuts uh, on the material and squaring up a block. Uh, but that's definitely, uh, you know, another video. But one thing I do want to show is just what exactly can happen if the head is cocked out at an angle. Uh, because sometimes, frankly, people are too lazy to tram in the head. Uh, sometimes too lazy to even check it when they first walk up to a machine. Now, if you're working in industry, you may only... Uh, check the tram on the machine maybe once a month or something like that because you assume that uh, the person who did it 
uh, before you or the last time that it was checked did it correctly and it hasn't really been knocked out since then. And if somebody purposefully moved it out of position, they trammed it back in. That's like a common courtesy. Um, but here in the student machine shop, we really cannot make those assumptions. Uh, so you have to recheck the tram on both the head and on the vise every time you walk up to the machine. It might not be knocked out, but it very well may be. So you really just need to know what can go wrong here. Why do you need to tram in the head, right? So why is it important for you not to be lazy and actually tram it in? So let, let's go ahead and I'm gonna knock this out uh, and then I'll show you what it does to the cut. Okay, so right here I just have a piece of aluminum, doesn't really matter what the material is, but I set it in the vise and clamped it. And right here I've got a fly cutter that we talked about earlier in the lecture portion of this. And the head is still tram, and I'm going to go ahead and take a cut over this surface, and um, let's see what it does. At a thousand RPM. I'm going to touch off on the top. Okay, so I'm going to take, uh, I don't know, 20 thousandths or so. Okay, so that right there is a nice flat surface. If you put some kind of a straight edge over it, you can see that uh, there's really no gap anywhere in either direction. And uh, if we were to measure between these two sides, uh, they would both be quite parallel to one another, right? So the measurement from here to here to here to here to here to here to here uh, would all be about the same, okay? So we got a flat, surface that was parallel. Now what would happen if we knocked the head out? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, knock out the nod and let's see what happens. Okay, so now the spindle is at an angle on the nod, and uh, let me go ahead and turn this on and take a cut, and I think it'll be pretty clear what's going on. Okay, that should be pretty clear. I mean, you could see that this was cutting at an angle. So whatever, you know, this, this surface on the bottom here is, you know, square to the vise and everything, but the surface that we machined relative to it is not gonna be parallel, right? The distance here is smaller than the distance over here, right? And uh, that's definitely a problem. And so if we put that straight edge on there, you can see that it, the surface itself is still pretty flat, right? It's just not parallel to the other surface. So this is an exaggerated uh, example, but this kind of thing is going to be happening on a slightly smaller scale if you have that uh, cutter even slightly out of square with the, uh, the rest of the machine. Um, and so what you need to do, I mean, you know, that, that amount might be very, very small. It could maybe only be like a thousandth of an inch or two thousandths of an inch, you know, something like that. But on some of these tolerances, we're trying to hold something like a thousandth of an inch in parallelism or perpendicularity. And there's no real way to hold that if you know that your tool is already further than that out of spec. Okay, so now let me, let me put this back 
in tram on the nod and I'll cock it out on the tilt. Let's see if that has a different effect. So now I'm not going to tram it in really, really closely because it doesn't matter for this test. You'll still be able to see everything that you need to see. Okay, so let's cock this one out. So I think it's pretty clear what's going on here. You can see that the spindle's going off at this angle now, but I'm actually going to feed the table in exactly the same direction. So that doesn't change, but the angle that I'm off with the head, that has changed. So let's see what happens. So, look what happened. This time, we didn't cut a surface that was out of parallelism. We cut a surface that isn't flat. It's curved. It's actually dished out in the center. So we put a straight edge over it. Ooh, there's a big old gap in the middle, right? It's actually not dished out in this direction, but it is most definitely dished out in this direction. Why is that? So look at the path that this cutting tool takes as it comes around the surface. So in its center position right here, it's actually further down than it is on either side. That's why it's cutting this sort of concave surface. And that's because this cutting tool will only cut a flat surface if it's perfectly perpendicular to the axis of travel meaning that the cutting edge is always the same distance away from the surface no matter where it is in 360 degrees of rotation, right? If it's off at an angle like this, then it's actually, it has an apex when it's sort of in this position, and then as it gets in any direction, either this way or this way from that apex, it actually moves further and further away. And when it's at its 180 degree opposite point, it's at its furthest furthest most point from that surface, right? And that's why it cuts that concave surface. Now again, this is greatly exaggerated, but this is going to be happening to some degree when you're um, trimming in this head. And maybe it's only a thou or two, but again, that matters if your uh, tolerances for flatness, parallelism, and perpendicularity are around a thousandth of an inch as well. So it's really, really important that at least for finishing your surfaces, you trim this in very, very well. Okay, so this brings me to my very, very last point, a kind of point that I mentioned, uh, but didn't really maybe explain all that well. And that is, what is the difference between tramming off of the table and tramming off of the vice surface? So let's say that this, is our spindle. And let's say that we've got a drill in there. Okay, we've got a drill. I'm going to drill something. Um, so here's our table. Here's our vice surface. And let's just say that for whatever reason, it's a really, really crappy vice, and uh, the vice surfaces are at an extreme angle. So then, of course, our part is going to be held at an extreme angle as well. So in this case, of course, it would be better to tram off of the vice surface because that way 
our spindle is at an angle so that it's per perpendicular to the part surface. And so then we're going to drill a hole that is going to be uh, square to the part, right? That makes sense. Because if we orient it perpendicular to the table, well, the hole is going to go off at an angle, right? So that's not something that we want. So for drilling, we definitely want that. But what if we're milling a surface? Let me just go ahead and redraw this. OK, and then here's our fly cutter. There's our fly cutter. Nope. There's our part. OK, now the, the actual effective geometry of this fly cutter is going to be something like that, right? When you actually turn it on, it's spinning. And so it behaves as if it were a cutter that looked like this. So that's what I'm going to draw. Right, and you can see that that should follow the same angle. So the bottom of the fly cutter right there uh, is perpendicular at 90 degrees to the spindle axis. Okay. So now if we take a cut, we're using the table to feed, right? We're not feeding the part along the top of the vise, right? It's clamped to the vise, but we're feeding the table left and right along the x-axis. So as soon as we take a cut, we're going to remove this material right here, okay? But if we, let's just say that we look at the part like that, Let's say we're looking at the part, okay? This is what we're going to see over here. You'll have to apologize. This is the best that I can do here. So this right here is the part. And uh, here's our tool. There's our tool. There's our tool. And um, so it's exactly like when we had the head tipped at the wrong angle, right? So now we're cutting this concave surface right here, right? Because the cutter is following this path. And it has an apex point right here, but it gets further away from that as it comes around, right? And so not only now are we getting a surface that's not parallel to the uh, part surface right there, right? This is not, this surface here is not parallel to this one, but also it's concave. So this is like the worst of both worlds, right? So whenever we are tramming the head in order to mill flat surfaces like this, we definitely want to tram off of the table. Because then, let me go ahead and redraw this. So let's say that this is the cutter, and this is the part. OK, now if we cut that surface right there, it's true that the surface is not going to be parallel to the surface that's sitting on the vise, but at least it's going to be flat, right? At least it's going to be flat. So that's better than having it be out of parallelism and also not flat, right? So this is all also predicated on this vice surface, or, or rather the, the surface that actually touches the table, and the vice surfaces that you're putting the parallels on, that you're putting the part on, those being really out of spec. I mean, they should be super parallel to one another if they were uh, even reasonably well made to begin with, OK? So usually, this is just academic. Um, but it's definitely possible that uh, they'll be knocked out a bit, OK? And so there's a little bit of a nuance there. Frankly, for roughing, it really doesn't matter whether you tram off of the uh, off of the vise or off of the table. Uh, but for finishing, finishing surfaces, I would definitely say tram off of the table. And that means removing the vise, 
Okay? So it's much more convenient to trim off the vise because you don't have to move the vise. But uh, for better precision, you should really remove the vise and do it directly off of the table. Now, sometimes people get a little bit lazy and they'll move the table over and put the tramming plate right here. Okay? And then the, uh, the actual knee is over here, right? And all of this section of the table is hanging off to the left. Well, the problem with that is that there's a little bit of clearance between the table and the knee here, or the carriage, rather. This is called the carriage. Um, so there's a little bit of clearance there. And so if you slide everything all the way over to one side, the table is going to sag a little bit over here, which is going to throw the angle off on the entire table. Also, even though this is made out of cast iron, uh, it's still susceptible to a little bit of flexing just under its own weight. So again, instead of just cocking out at a, at a nice angle, this thing is going to sag like that. So it's actually going to bow. Another problem with that is that we always use the table in the center of its travel. And so if it's going to wear anywhere, it's going to wear in the center. And so in real life, the top of the table looks a little bit like this. I mean, that's greatly exaggerated, but yeah, that's what it looks like. So that's where our vise actually sits. And so if you put the tramming plate over here, well, it's sitting at a different angle than if you put it in the center of the table. So several different reasons why you really want to have the table in the center of its travel um, and why you want to have the tramming plate on the center. So if you're going to indicate off of the tabletop, you should do it with the vise off in the center of the table in the center of travel. Some nuanced, nuanced points, but very important to consider. Anyway, that's it for this first part of the demonstration. And the next part is going to be squaring up a block. I'll see you then.